I remember kind of finding this transition point in in the medicine the curriculum where it got very road learning heavy, meaning like I remember having to do a lot of memorization and it, it just became less and less fun over time. The process of it, I think, you know, I, I was still fascinated by the idea of medicine, the profession of doctors, very noble profession, but the process became a bit, you know, not fun. In today's episode, we have Shimmel, Director of Engineering at Uber. Welcome, Shimmel. Hello. Hi. Nice to be here, Felix. Yeah, glad to have you on. So you actually have a very interesting a path into software engineering where you transitioned from medicine into engineering. Tell us more about uh, when you made that decision. What was that transition like? Yeah, sure. So yeah, I mean, I, I, so I grew up in India as a quick backdrop. And one of the things that happens around grade 11 in India is you kind of pick your pre-major of sorts. So it was kind of a decision point for me. And I was, I knew I wanted to be in hard sciences, but I wasn't quite sure between engineering and medicine. I went through quite a few career counselors and eventually decided to give medicine a shot. And actually, I kind of enjoyed the beginning part of my journey with medicine. I was being, we were being taught genetics at the time, I remember. And genetics is really cool. Like, you know, it's like fairly new overall and lots of kind of logic-based reasoning that, that, that genetics entails. So it was, it was kind of fun. But I remember kind of finding this transition point in, in the medicine the curriculum where it got very road learning heavy, meaning like I remember having to do a lot of memorization and it, it just became less and less fun over time. The process of it, I think, you know, I, I was still fascinated by the idea of medicine, the profession of doctors, very noble profession, but the process became a bit, you know, not fun. But anyway, a, a year into this, I got the opportunity to go to Singapore on a scholarship and to study in Singapore for, a, for two years in what they call a junior college. And that was kind of a reset opportunity for me. It was a moment of pause to kind of see and reflect where I was and what I wanted to do next, whether I wanted to continue to pursue medicine or consider a switch. And I think given that I wasn't quite loving, you know, the rote learning side of things, I was like, okay, well, something needs to switch. And so I, I decided to switch to engineering and kind of give that a shot. Yeah, it sounds like your career has been gone through a couple of pivots. Another one that you made was when you were at your uh, career at Microsoft, where you switched from a software development engineer in test, or some people might call a QA engineer, to a software like development engineer. So, what what made you uh, make this uh, transition? So, like I said, I think you know some pivots are intentional and some pivots are not. I, this one was was definitely intentional. So, a quick backdrop. I I was I started my career at Microsoft, and before actually, I was an I was an intern at Microsoft for a couple of summers, and I was uh, interning as a test engineer. So I I naturally joined as a full time test engineer, and about you know five six months into my full time role, I realized I wasn't enjoying my day to day. It was not fun. It felt like a Groundhog Day kind of a vibe. After a while, like I just felt like my learning was very slow. The amount of satisfaction I got from what I was doing was was kind of diminishing over time. And, you know, we typically work in a team of, in a large team of, of, of you know, cross-functional folks, right? So we had QA and we had developers and PMs, et cetera. And I always remember going to the stand-ups and, and thinking, well, these engineers are doing the cool work. Like, that's the fun part. Like, that sounds, you know, intellectually stimulating and challenging and rewarding. So I kind of knew what good looked like, I guess, because I was seeing it play out. And I think once I had that, I was very clear that I, I needed a switch and that I needed to move. So I think for me, it was fairly quick into my career. And so I made that switch about a few months in. I remember hitting a couple of walls internally too. Like I remember talking to this really senior engineering manager in, in my larger org. And I was like, you know, I want some advice. Uh, what do you think? I'm looking to like switch into the role. But interestingly, his response to me was, you should stay in test. You know, test as a discipline needs more, more talent. And... I remember being a little like weirded out by that discussion because I was like, wait, are you, is that a compliment that you're saying I'm good and I should stay in test? Or is that like an offhanded way of saying, no, you're not good enough for a dev, for a dev role? So it's like this weird thing. But, you know, I sat with that for, for a few weeks, but eventually I was like, no, I want to do this. And so I, yeah, so I started interviewing internally and eventually landed a role within the same org. Um, so yeah, very, very glad I made that switch. Yeah, and, and you know, you saw what happened at Microsoft in general. When, when you look at the rest of the industry, what do you think is the future of test engineering or QA engineering? Yeah, 
I think test engineering plays a, a big role in specific domains. So I'll start with like, for instance, anything to do with hardware will need a ton of QA discipline, mostly because hardware is just a different, a whole other ballgame. There's no rollbacks of sort. Like you really need to be buttoned up. In fact, even when I was at Microsoft, they did keep the QA discipline for certain specific teams and, spe- spe- and especially the hardware teams. And I do think it, there is a, a place for test infrastructure, for instance, like building tools and infrastructure to enable testing is still quote unquote development work because you are writing software. But I think that the pure discipline of writing unit tests or integration tests or end-to-end you know, tests, that can be democratized. I think that, you know, assuming your, your test infrastructure is solid, you can expect your developers to be writing the test code as they, as they go along, right? So I think that the testing industry will continue to have investments because we need those tools, but the actual writing of the test can, doesn't necessarily need a dedicated set of you know, functional teams focused just on that. And for someone out there that maybe sees what you're saying and sees what you saw at the time too, and they want to make this transition before it's like too late and they are in QA or test engineering, they want to switch into a software developer, software engineer. How do you recommend they make this switch? Yeah, so I think a couple of things. One is, uh, know what you're applying for. Like in, in my case, I was very aware of the domain, right? I, I worked on it with the same team. So I, I knew the context really well. Uh, definitely had that benefit. I mean, I knew the tech stack, all of that jazz. But I, I would say like, you know, if you're going cold turkey, like, and if you have less context, just try to get as much information as you can about the area you're going into. And separately, know what part of it you want to work on. Are you applying for a full stack role, a back end role, a front end role, mobile role? Because that will determine how to prep for your interviews as well. Know what your interest lies in. And then when you are doing the interview practice, et cetera, focus on that domain. I think practicing and uh, mock interviews are great because then you get to actually practice and keep iterating and improving. Practice, practice, practice. What do you think is the job market like today? Like, Do you think it's harder now to find a job in software engineering for someone that Let's say that they are in college or are self-studying right now, or maybe going to a boot camp or something, that they're looking to enter the job market for the first time like this year or maybe early next year. What's the realistic expectations that you would you would give them? Look, I think I think we live in we're living in an interesting time. You know, so I zoom out and look at it from a decade, you know, decade long uh, perspective. Software engineering as a role is still one of the most interesting fields out there. It's a very well-paying field. It is in demand and still in high demand. I know, you know, we have, we're going through some interesting times. There's economic slowdown on one hand coming from the heels of COVID and, and the war and the global situation in general. And the current environment where companies are being forced to show growth and profitability. So yeah, so companies are maybe not hiring at the speed at which they were hiring three years ago. That is probably the case. But I will say that there's still a lot of hiring. There's still a lot of software engineering roles that are open out there. My take is that the, the way it will, it will likely play out uh, for someone who's looking for a job is that you will just have to interview for longer to find that the right fit. And perhaps not be as picky in the, the company they're applying to because there is less of a selection compared to maybe a few years ago. So it's not terribly bad. It is a little bit worse because we've also come from a, from a place of abundance and I think maybe overabundance. So our baseline has been set very high, I think. But yeah, I, I do think that anyone who's looking for a job, anyone who's in college, I think if you're persistent, you'll definitely land something. Like there's, there's enough startups still. Yes, there's less funding to go around, but that doesn't mean there aren't any startups. There still are many startups. What's your, I guess, feeling about where we're at in this kind of period? Because I guess late 2022 was when we started seeing things like layoffs and hiring freezes and that kind of extended into the first half of this year. Do you see things like in the same position as last year or getting better or like kind of the same? Like what, what are your, what's your feeling at this, at this point? It's definitely better than last year. I think last year was, I remember this time it was just a string of layoff news and like it was just it was a lot more anecdotally and like even people I personally know. But now I think it has slowed down. It hasn't recovered completely yet. 2025, maybe things start to go back to home. I don't know. The global landscape is also evolving very rapidly and moving. So it's not entirely clear, but I think that we're not, we're not completely out of the woods yet. So I think that that will likely continue as a trend in 2024. 
you mentioned how we came, it looks much worse in contrast to like 2020, 2021, first half of 2022, because we came from a, a place of abundance, like, like you said. And I think a lot of people were attracted to this idea of becoming a software engineer, probably because they were seeing like, wow, there's a lot of buzz right now for even more so than usual for this career path. But in your opinion, like when someone is thinking about transitioning into software engineering, getting into tech, would you say for someone out there, like how, how would you determine whether someone should or should not be a software engineer? What kind of like hard questions should they be asking themselves? Like how, who should not be a software engineer? Look, I mean, I don't think there's anyone who should not consider this role. Like if, if someone is interested and is, you know, is passionate about building things and I, you know, especially software and hardware, I think engineering is, is for everyone, really. I think, you, you know, what you have to be willing to do is, is put in the hard work. You know, no one is, is born with any of these skills. These are very, like, literally hard technical skills that you have to learn. Uh, but you have to put in the work, right? And I think that if you, if, you're, if you have a growth mindset, if you're, you know, ready to learn and put in the time, then you can get there. It's a combination of will and skill. Like, if you have the strong will to do something in the field, those skills are easy to get, especially with, online courses and so much content and that is available for free, by the way, you can learn on your own. Like, you know, you don't even need a college degree these days. So, you know, even boot camps can get you a head start. So if anything, I think the bar for entry has only gone, gone lower in terms of access, right? More people have access to the same content and the same tools. So if, yeah, I mean, I think if you're willing, give it a shot, give it a shot, but give it, give it time, have patience. Yeah, and now that you're uh, over a decade into your career, looking back on that time, if you had to start all over again and be transported back into, let's say, your first, maybe maybe even in college or maybe your first internships or your first uh, real job, what are some things you wish you knew before becoming a software engineer? Yeah, I think I would like talk to more senior people along the way. I kind of learned by trial and error in a way and, and pivoted along the way. Which, by the way, is, is a completely fine strategy. I'm not doing that wrong, but probably not efficient, right? I lost time along the way doing things I didn't really enjoy doing. And like, you know, if you're in college, you don't actively get to interact a lot with industry people, for, for instance. But when you do, and especially in those internships and those, you know, moments of career fairs or whatever opportunities that you do get, grab those and really lean into those and, and Find people that you can truly have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with or people you admire who can guide you on how they got to where they are. So I think, I, I just think learning from others is something I could have been more proactive about in, in retrospect, looking back, and I probably would have had a more quicker path with just to back end, being a backend engineer. Well, I appreciate you coming on here now to kind of uh, pay that forward to, to help other people that may be looking at this path. I'm sure you get this all the time where maybe family or friends or friends of family come up to you and say they're interested in, in learning how to code, learning to become a software engineer. What, what, what advice would you give them? Like if you were to design the path that could lead to the most likely case of you becoming a software engineer, like what is that path in your mind and in your experience or in what you've seen from your colleagues, like what is the, the I wouldn't say the best path, but like what is like a, a good path that can lead to becoming a software engineer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, I mean, I think it depends on kind of the stage of, of life you're in. If you're, of course, at a moment when you're entering college, you know, that's a great place to learn or even high school, right? I started learning my programming when I was in high school. So depending on your, the phase of life you're in, the answer may vary. If you're already working professional and you're looking to, to switch into engineering, I would say start with an, with an online course. I think there's just so much content out there. I... I remember taking the startup engineering course on Coursera and like really found it to be real, you know, fun. Even college, to be honest, gives you a small window into the world of software engineering because uh, even if you're a computer science major, your your projects in a specific class are very contained and in a very siloed environment. But in the real world, it's very different, right? And so hopefully you get some exposure through internships, but if not, like, Taking some of these courses will give you an idea of like what the real world entails. So startup engineering was cool as a course because it, you know, it kind of it was, they were making you make a website and create a business as a project, which was over multiple weeks. And what that did was it, it kind of got you to think full stack, um, think about distributed systems, think about scale. And it was kind of doing a bit of theory and practice at the same time. So I really liked that format and it 
would really bring the theory to life very quickly. So anyway, that was one example of a course, but there are many, many courses out there that you know uh, are available. So they start with those. And I think taking those will give you an idea of like whether you enjoy the process. Meaning, you know, coding um, obviously has a lot of basics and fundamentals like, you know, data structures and, and algorithms and, and theore- the theoretical knowledge of like what's good versus bad in terms of design practices. But before you even get into all of that theory, try out something that's actually building from zero to 100 and see for yourself whether you enjoy that process. Because that'll give you a, like a sense of like, okay, if you enjoyed that output, then you can focus on, okay, you know what? I will invest in learning all the theoretical stuff about all these algorithms and these data structures. Because if you start, if, you, if you're starting from the theory, it's, it's, it's going to be a while until you, you, you're going to taste the fruit, the output. And then that you know, along the way, you may lose interest and be like, okay, this is way too much effort, or this is like not worth my time, or this is not fun. Uh, but when you taste that output in the beginning, then you're like, okay, you know what? I get it. I get why I need to know about algorithm, algorithms. I get why I need to know which data structure to use and when, because it'll, it'll click in your mind about why that's critical in the end. So anyway, that's, that's one recommendation. I think boot camps are another great way because boot camps also give you the community, which is an, a big, big bonus. It's like learning from each other is just critically important. And the latent knowledge you get by just even watching somebody code. That's why pair programming is such a, such a big, big deal in, in companies, because when you watch someone do their work, you just learn even, even small things like, hey, what was that shortcut you used? Or what is this IDE configuration you have that is, you know, making your code look pretty? You know, small things matter at the end of the day. And so, yeah, I think boot camps are great because they give you that opportunity. And you can also, again, ask questions that, you know, in real time and get feedback that's so more efficient learning wise as well. So, yeah, I think, you know, if you, it depends on like how you learn. Some people are really good at self learning, some people need a structured environment. And so think about what works best for you and flexibility wise and then commit, commit to it and, you know, and truly commit to it. Like if you're, if you're taking a 12 week Coursera course, just truly do that and finish it off and, and see how you feel and then assess. If you're doing the bootcamp, go through it. Like don't, don't, you know, give up halfway. Commit to it and then see how you feel at the end. So hopefully, you, you know, I think once you get a taste of it, it's, it's, you get the real deal. Yeah, I love that advice about getting a taste of it first just to see if you are even interested in in what in doing the actual job rather than like what you might hear about the job. So I think that that's great advice. So thank you so much for coming on. Shibo, Director of Engineering at Uber, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your journey, experience, and advice with us. Awesome. Well, thank you for having me, Felix, and have a, have a great rest of the day.